Please welcome to the stage Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council, Mr. Damon Wilson. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to NATO Engages. I want to thank the Right Honorable Ben Wallace, our hosts, the Her Majesty's Government, uh, for helping to set the scene with that, those set of opening remarks. You heard from the minister a strong commitment of, to the alliance, a sense of how NATO has safeguarded our communities, our populations over the past 70 years, but how it remains focused today on its transformation for the future. You heard the minister just say, no side deals, no separate voices. This is meant to be the 70th anniversary leaders meeting, a capstone to a year of celebrating NATO's 70th anniversary. It was meant to be after Brexit. And yet here we are in the midst of a British election. Brexit still plays out. Leaders are gathering in the wake of acrimony over Syria. Strong words from President Macron challenging the, his peers with sharp rebukes from some other NATO leaders. Many of you, many NATO officials today are holding their breath watching Donald Trump's Twitter account to see what he might say. But beneath all this noise, part of what we want to unpack today at NATO Engages, beneath the noise, things are happening. And that's the conversation we want to have today about how NATO is preparing for its future. We're going to watch this leaders meeting unfold over the next 24 hours in really three big areas. One about the unity and solidarity of the alliance despite that noise, and you're going to see that come through in a big deal on common funding, on progress on sharing the burden within the alliance. You'll see the family expand as they welcome North Macedonia, Prime Minister Zayev, to the table. But you're also going to hear more, as the Defense Secretary said, about NATO's transformation, about its capabilities. It's not just money, it's for what? With more forces in the East, the Baltic, and the Black Sea, and I think we're going to see some of the strongest language we've ever seen alliance leaders used about the challenge faced from Russia. But the last point the Defense Secretary laid out, perhaps the most important to inform our conversations today, is about the future, about how this alliance adapts. We will see alliance leaders take up China, perhaps the first time in a summit declaration, a summit statement, we'll hear about China. You've heard that space and cyber introduced as new domains as NATO focuses on the future and will focus today on technology and how that impacts the security environment. And finally, climate as well is something all of our leaders are recognizing as an urgent issue. We're going to begin this debate with a terrific conversation with some terrific friends, colleagues, panelists on what's NATO's role in an insecure world, adapting to an era of great power competition. So I want to invite to the stage the panelists who will help us kick this off. Thomas Valasak, the director of Carnegie Europe. Corey Shockey, deputy director general of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Thomas Gomar, the, of the Institut Francais de Relations Internationales et Free. And Gunnar Ibet, senior advisor to the president of Turkey on Foreign Policy. Welcome. It's a pleasure, pleasure to have you with us. <laughs> We're going to use this session to set the scene, to get into some of the issues that we've heard from the Secretary of Defense. But I also want to use it to put this conversation in the context of the real world, what's happening right now. And I want to start with you, Gilner, if I may. Share with us a little bit of the view from Ankara, the view from Turkey on the alliance. President Erdogan has spoken out quite strongly in reaction to President Macron's statements in the past few days. Many have raised questions about what kind of relationship Turkey is building with Russia through mill-to-mill -mill ties on the S-400. There's acrimony within the alliance on the approach to Syria. And yet, President Erdogan came forward to say that Turkey is the most important, strongest member of the alliance in that retort. So give us a perspective from Ankara to help us understand how President Erdogan is coming into this leaders' meeting. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to start a little bit about posing some questions. Ten, about one, two. Go... 
question surrounding this summit is not so much about the role of NATO in an insecure world, but how NATO stays together, I think, in an insecure world, which is a very fundamental uh, question. Now, NATO has never been shy or short of trying to adapt itself, and it did this very remarkably in the 1990s, which was great. But the problem is the 1990s are over. And I think this is one of the things we need to digest. So all of this uh, triumph of absorbing the post-communist states through st uh, projecting stability, enlargement, partnership programs waned with new challenges, such as the rise of Russia and China, uh, the alteration of trade routes with new initiatives like Belt and Road, cyber attacks, hybrid warfare. Technology transcended our traditional understanding of boundaries. And when we add to that the growing geopolitical instability, particularly in the Middle East, that's left fragmented states and the greatest refugee crisis of our time, amidst all these geopolitical stages, uh, changes, we also have an essential ideological battle within the West between those who would like to preserve an international liberal order and those who prefer an inward-looking protectionist policies. Now, that's a pretty long list of how much the world has changed. So I, I suppose leading on from that is a question, why is NATO still facing this new world with the tools of the 1990s? And in the midst of all this change, the biggest challenge, I think, for NATO is that allies are beginning to have different security priorities. Today, one of NATO's allies, Turkey, faces a dire national security threat from terrorist attacks. These are augmented, planned, supported, and trained from across our border from Syria. It's a 915-kilometer border, and it's NATO's border. But NATO allies, unfortunately, have failed to understand this existential threat of the YPG to Turkey. Just in this last operation, we have closed off over 460 tunnels that lead from Syria into our country. These tunnels augment and support terrorist attacks that kill Turkish civilians, Turkish armed forces. These are the armed forces of NATO. So if NATO members do not acknowledge this existential threat to Turkey, I think this will undermine NATO. But Turkey does not question NATO's foundation or its purpose. It questions the alliance's understanding of Turkey's national security threats. And it believes that we should engage in a realistic and frank dialogue about this. It's about time. We do not question the validity of Article 5. On the contrary, we expect it to be fulfilled. A NATO that is fit for purpose would acknowledge this existential threat to Turkey. And this would actually make NATO stronger, not weaker. As I mentioned, we have a very long list of challenges. Isn't it better that we start working together to address them? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gunnar. Let me pick up on this. You mentioned a battle, an uh, ideological battle, even within the West. Toma, let me turn to you. Um, you're here after President Macron has sort of set the terms for a little <laughs> bit of the debate over the next 24 hours. Uh, in a way that he was trying to challenge Europe to be a more geopolitical, geostrategic player uh, by shaking up his peers with the brain dead comments uh, as everyone's familiar with. Um, can you unpack a little bit what you see as French strategy coming uh, into NATO, into this leaders meeting? Sure, if you allow me, I will stand up because Please. this chair is a sort of instrument of torture, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> so I prefer to stand up. And, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to throw the French off balance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's a bit difficult for nowadays to be a think tanker in France because our president is much more provocative than all the think, think tankers, you know. <laughs> you stole your thunder. So now my job is certainly to be more balanced. So we are in a completely reversed situation. Now, more seriously, um, what has been said by uh, President Macron is obviously very serious. And I think that uh, what is um, expected is to have a real strategic dialogue, a, a real strategic discussion, and not to continue as if everything was okay. For sure it's not the case, and that it was said rightly, for instance, the, uh, the assessment made by Turkey is very important. 
Uh, there is also the different assessment of Russia. There is also the different assessment regarding the future of the transatlantic relations, for instance. So let me focus on the transatlantic relation because I do believe that NATO is the key element for the future of the transatlantic relation. The thing is that the North Atlantic is less important in strategic terms than it was previously. There is a shift of the center of gravity towards North uh, Atlantic to the uh, east of Asia. That's a fact. We should adapt to that. It's a real concern, namely for, for Europeans, which will be much more in a periphery, peripheral situation than the US in the next uh, decade. So that leads me to see that if NATO should be yes, useful, and I do believe it will be uh, useful in the next decade, it is precisely, you know, to contribute to the future of the transatlantic relation, which is at the, uh, at the time being in danger, because the, the over part of the transatlantic relation, it is the EU, which is more and more often blamed by the US in terms of trade policy, for instance. So I do think that the future of NATO is certainly to try to improve the relation with the EU, precisely to contribute to the future of the transatlantic relations. So I stop there on that, but I do think that, you know, uh, what, what has been said many times by President Macron is just to avoid Europe to be sandwiched in the next decade between the US and China. So let me turn to Corey. We've just heard, you know, President Erdogan's challenging the status quo, President Macron's challenging the status quo, perhaps no one more is trying to challenge the status quo than President Donald Trump. How do you see the United States, which has been so focused on this issue of burden sharing, but in a way that has produced questions about America's commitment in the alliance. Now that this is not President Trump's first NATO engagement, how do you see the U.S. approach to this evolving? Well, I was super sympathetic to Tomas's problem of the president being so provocative <laughs> that it doesn't leave space for anybody else. Mine is less valuable. <laughs> <laughs> But Corey, President, we've known you long enough to know you can be provocative. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Uh, President Trump is particularly uh, ungracious in how he engages the burden-sharing argument, but he's not wrong, and he's not alone among Americans questioning why our closest friends in the world aren't doing, contributing more to our common defense. That's a very widespread view in the United States. And what's wonderful about the NATO alliance is that under Secretary General Stoltenberg's leadership, NATO allies have responded to that, right? The, the challenge for a collective of free states is winning the argument, right? Because we all have to agree to, in order to move ahead together. And NATO allies have responded really positively, even when asked so rudely and so demandingly by President Trump. So on behalf of my fellow Americans, can I just say thank you, my friends, for being so generous to us in a difficult time? Because that's actually what NATO's done really well for 70 years. We all of us have important differences with each other, but the fundamental bargain of the NATO alliance is that each of our countries feels safer cooperating together to protect ourselves. That's the basic bargain, and I still think it's extraordinarily robust. So perhaps, um, interestingly enough, perhaps no longer new, but the newer members of the alliance perhaps today are the status quo members. Tomas, um, you're sitting in Brussels, you come from Slovakia. Give us a little bit of the perspective of how this is seen from Central Europe in the context of our conversation, an insecure world. Our allies in the East are those that have felt the most insecure because of Vladimir Putin's actions. How has the alliance, in your view, adapted to the concerns and interests of Central Europe uh, in transforming its ability to deter and defend against uh, a revanchist Russia? Great question, Damon, and thanks everyone for coming and taking the time. Good to be here. Uh, so far, so good, Damon, is the short answer, in a sense that the response after the 2014 Russian aggression to Ukraine has been appreciated. The deployment of the four battle groups in the three Baltic countries and Poland does make a difference. But there's also a newfound concern. I mean, some of it is, of course, 
about the U.S. commitment to NATO. Uh, I agree fully with Corey. The burden sharing debate is as old as the alliance itself. You can read the books on NATO history. You'll find echoes of it even before NATO started. They were uh, from 19, uh, late 1940s. Um, but there's something new in President Trump's tone, um, a, a sense that, the, uh, uh, that he brings a zero-sum approach to international relations, which does make us worry in, in Central Europe. And more recently, confusion, going back to what Thomas said earlier, confusion more than anything else about French ideas and French policies, particularly with regard to Russia. Now, let me dwell a little bit on this last point. There is no so reflexive insistence on things always remaining the way they are. Uh, there is, I think, opening towards debating what better sort of living arrangement one can reach with Russia. I guess we're a bit more... Um, um, we have lower expectations, perhaps, than France of what might be achieved in terms of uh, improved European-Russian uh, conversation or European-Russian security architecture. But where the really, is the, where the really main confusion lies is how exactly, what exactly is President Macron's plan for engaging the Central European allies, countries that have tried really hard in Central Europe, countries like Estonia, which have troops in Mali, not just Estonia, the Czech Republic and Romania too, that have tried really hard to put themselves in, in, in the shoes of France and of Paris and to understand the French concerns and the French view of the world are finding that there is little compensation, if you will, little, little so quid pro quo. When President Macron did give the speech on, on, uh, on uh, more recently to The Economist, the interview in which he mentioned the need for resetting uh, relations with Russia, he cited President Orban, or Prime Minister Orban, as the example of who is the so good Central European, somebody who understands his point of view. So uh, let me end with this confusion about how exactly you, you agree with the French, an opening perhaps to, again, exploring better relationship with Russia as well as a better, bigger role for the European Union and Europe writ large in security matters, but a confusion about what exactly President Macron wants. So it's a bit ironic that NATO has come together to begin transforming itself because of the challenge from Russia, and we see a far more vigorous alliance than we've seen deploying in the East because of the challenge from Russia, and that if you've just pointed out President Macron perhaps suggesting a reset with Russia. I want you to speak to that. Explain, Thomas, how France sees Russia. President Erdogan doing military relationships, raising questions about the relationship with Russia. And President Trump uh, perhaps unwilling sometimes to call out Russia for its actions. So help, help me understand this, that the alliance has transformed more than it has in, in, in decades because of a Russian challenge, and yet three key countries are raising questions. Thomas, what is Macron trying to do? Well, that's a very important issue, and I will try to clarify the, the, this confusion. First of all, and it's not to be provocative, but I think we should not portray France as a pro-Russian country. France within NATO didn't buy Russian weapons, so it will be also a question, you know, on, on this side. Very first point. Second, um, I think we should be back, you know, uh, to the um, situation in Ukraine. In fact, many critics can be made, you know, about what was done with the Normandy formats, but to a, a certain point, it stops the escalation from my point of view. So we'll, we'll have the next meeting, you know, 9th of December, and I think it's positive for all of us in terms of uh, stabilizing, you know, European security. Third, I think that what is said, you know, by President Macron should be also understood in the overall context. Yes, he said rapprochement with Russia because he does believe that it's a very, um, how to say, tricky situation in which we have today less contacts with Russia than during the Cold War with the, with the USSR. There are less working uh, channels at the time being. And that's a paradox, you know because the situation is completely different from the one uh, during the, the, the end of the, of the Cold War. So that leads me to the overall, you know, vision of President Macron was to say, yes, rapprochement with Russia, without being naive, he said all the time, you know, in his discourse. We know pretty well the Russian regime, believe me, because there was uh, interference, you know, during our election, like uh, in the U.S. and so on. I can elaborate on that. But you had this rapprochement, and you have also another thing which is very important and which has not been un underlined, in my view, which is also the Indo-Pacific strategy. That leads to the concern, which is, to some extent, addition with rapprochement with Russia plus Indo-Pacific strategy leads to China. 
which is maybe a way also to have um, a real discussion with the U.S. So I'm going to pick up the China theme in just a minute, but let me play out Russia first. So President Macron and President Erdogan have had a little bit of a public spat coming to the summit, and yet we're hearing that perhaps both of them are pursuing in their own ways some kind of rapprochement with Russia. Turkey has bought weapons, the S-400. Mm -hmm. Gulnar, what is, what is President Erdogan trying to do with Turkey, Russia? Well, I mean, I think they're two separate issues. Turkey's relationship with Russia is largely a compartmentalized relationship. You know, when it's a pragmatic compartmentalized relationship. Areas where we do agree on, where we can cooperate, we do. Things we disagree on, we leave them outside the door when we have to cooperate. And this is a necessity because we're very close to each other. We're sort of uh, reliant on each other in the energy trade as well, supply and consumption. And uh, we've got the Russian, the Turkish stream project as well. So there's lots of uh, issues there that bind us together and compel us to cooperate. But like I said, it's a very compartmentalized relationship. Now, the S-400 is a separate issue because it's really a requirement. We have a military requirement for our own air and missile defense, which we've had on the table since the 1990s. And we did try to purchase it through other means. We asked for the Patriot about 10 years ago. The United States didn't give it to us. We looked at other avenues. And uh, we settled for the S-400 because it fulfills this gap in our, in our defense systems for the time being. But it's not the end of the road. So we want to develop our own air and missile defense system, which we will do. But further down the road, we'll still look at other options. So it's not, you know, it doesn't end with this. But uh, as NATO Secretary General has said, Jens Stoltenberg has said, that this is actually an issue, it's a bilateral issue between the United States and Turkey because of the U.S. concerns about the F-35 program. And now we've set up a technical committee to look into this and to allay the concerns of the United States. It is not a NATO issue. This is a standalone system. And Jan Stoltenberg himself has said, you know, NATO cannot interfere in the procurement choices of their allies. So that's uh, basically, you know. Gunnar, I saw Corey shaking her head during your, <laughs> your comments. Corey, Russia, Turkey, Congress and the White House aren't exactly reacting on the same page. <laughs> Congress has been quite outspoken about its concern on Russia, potential for sanctions, and now you're hearing voices raise these concern about sanctions. Should Turkey even be a NATO ally is actually a conversation in our, our Congress. That's not really where President Trump's voice has been on this. How is this dynamic, how is the United States approaching this dynamic, handling Russia and allies that want relationships with Russia? Uh, so the fundamental thing to understand about the American government is that it was built by people who distrust government. Hmm. And so all of the various checks and balances, it's very easy to think that the president of the United States is the only important voice, but that's actually not true. The courts are an equal voice. The Congress is an equal voice. States balance the federal government. Uh, we're a big argument in the United States, and that fits who we are as a political culture. And so, for example, um, I find the president's attitude about Russia genuinely shocking, and so do the intelligence agencies of the United States government. But the president is disinclined to share their view of Russia's <laughs> interference in our elections, of the threat Russia poses for us, and so what you see uh, is the Congress taking action to counter the president's decisions. Because in the United States government, like in the alliance, you always have to win the argument. And the president of the United States hasn't won the argument with the American people or the American Congress about Russia. So when the new Congress was seated in January of 2019, one of the first legislative actions they took was denying the president of the United States money to remove any American troops from Europe because they didn't trust the president's judgment on NATO and on Russia. Uh, so we're a big mess, we're a big argument, but it's important to understand how strong the counterbalancing forces are from an American public that likes our allies, that's worried about a Russia that would invade uh, Ukraine and take Crimea and change borders in Europe by violence. So one of the things that we have seen agreement within the alliance, within Congress and the Senate, 
is to welcome our 30th alliance, uh, uh, ally into the alliance. I'm delighted to welcome our North Ma the Macedonian delegation. Uh, we're delighted to have you all as allies and to be part of the conversation. We're looking forward to having Prime Minister Zayev with us. Welcome. Welcome to the family. You'll see that once you join the family, it's like any family, we've got a lot of disputes within them. And, and I want to turn back. One of the reasons I referred to uh, North Macedonia um, is that folks have begun to notice that China has started to be present in Europe, has started to play an interesting role in the Western Balkans and Central Europe in particular, uh, across Europe. And we're going to see a leaders meeting that probably for the first time has a more structured conversation about what China is. We may see a statement that comes out that for the first time will refer to China, underscoring that this is where it's being an issue for the alliance. It doesn't mean there's a common approach yet. And so I want to ask this last question, then I'm going to turn to the audience, so get your questions ready. China, you sat around the NAC table, but you've also been in Central Europe, and many have been worried that has China been using Central Europe, the Western Balkans, the soft underbelly, to create a hold in, in, in Europe that will at some point, I think as you said, Toma, force Europe to hedge between the EU and the United States. Brilliant. Before I get to that, Damon, let me add my congratulations to North Macedonia. Slovakia was among the, uh, the biggest supporters of enlargement because we lived through the transformative effect enlargement or accession has had on our country and society. And, and I'm delighted that the alliance and the allies have been able to continue to extend it, uh, that effect uh, further uh, south, uh, southeast. So congratulations. Um, on to China. Uh, the existence of the 17 plus 1, for those of you in the room who don't know, that's the special format sort of agreement that Central European, many Central European countries and, and countries of West Balkans have with Beijing, that has obscured the reality of, of real divisions among Central Europeans on China. Now, the 17 plus 1 is, is, is sort of a political umbrella uh, which produces an annual statement to which I wouldn't attach much significance. The reality of it is the Central Europeans are essentially a good microcosm of the na broader NATO divisions uh, on China itself. You have countries within, in fact, divisions within the countries. You have within the Czech Republic, for example, national security establishment that is sharply laser focused on the consequences of Chinese investments into things like 5G, whatnot, and actually producing some of the best analysis among NATO countries on the potential consequences of being too naive about allowing uh, China to dominate our, the next uh, generation of IT. And you have even within the same country some of the best examples of how if you're soft on corruption, if you are soft on checks and balances, if you, are if you are soft on the powers of a judiciary, you allow not just China, but Russia and other nefarious actors to weaken your own ability to defend your own interests. The reality is China, much as Russia, isn't necessarily creating dependencies or creating vulnerabilities. They are praying, they are, they are, they are in, in, in many ways taking advantage of our own failures within Central Europe just as much as, as in broader Europe, again, to clean up the judicial systems, uh, to clean up the political act, to clean up things such as campaign financing. The best response to China and Russia in many ways isn't to get more alert and more paranoid about China and Russia, it's to take a look inwards fix the, the, uh, the weaknesses, vulnerabilities within our systems, because that is what allows China and Russia to have the undue influence on the politics they've had in some Central European countries lately. Thank you. So our Tom nice. Tomas talks about China and Russia together. Tomas used China as a rationale for why Macron might be talking a little bit differently about Russia. How does that divergence in strategy play out, Tomas? Well, Europeans continue to believe in free trade. They are against protectionism. Okay? So the, the real issue at the time being is with the US on that, plus with China and its attitude in investing you know, uh, in, in Europe. There is no possible um, free trade without you know, maritimization. So for me, when I am thinking about China from a European point of view, it is to say how oh, we do think simultaneously about the future of the trade and the sea power. Problem is that, you know, many uh, European countries don't understand that there is a world east of Suez. But I think that it's very important in strategic terms 
to try to explain to uh, other Europeans, especially to Germany, that it's very important to take Indo-Pacific into consideration if we do want to continue to have an open trade system. On a more, you know, a naval point of view, we have observed that the Chinese are more and more present, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea, also in the Baltic Sea. So that's something on which we should um, think gently. But my point on China is much more, you know, related to the sea power than to think about, you know, Russia and China jointly. It was said, it was, sorry, down by the US uh, and since, sorry, 2005, approximately. At that time, I must say, I was very skeptical. It was said in a, in a, in a statement made by President Bush. Now, what is interesting, it is the, the growing imbalance between China and Russia, which is very, believe me, uncomfortable for the Russians. So we should take this in comfort into consideration if we try to anticipate, you know, the next decade. So, Corey, at the last summit, the Americans showed up with a tough message on 5G, uh, and it hit some shoals. But now we've seen an evolution in this debate in Europe a little bit. How do you see, how should NATO be thinking about, why is NATO talking about China? NATO's talking about China because China's predatory behavior is making many countries in NATO nervous. And I think you see with the progression of the 5G debate in NATO countries that you're right, Damon, the United States came rolling in and said, anybody who buys a Huawei component is gonna be excluded from intelligence sharing. And that, uh, that sent a big signal. It wasn't a particularly graceful way to um, to talk to your closest friends and closest security partners. But I also think that, um, you know, the, NATO, the United States is not the only country who's worried about China using technical components, not just for espionage purposes, but for uh, undercutting governance and the rule of law in the societies in which they're operating, as Tomas just said. And I think the German debate about 5G, where the chancellor started out very strongly supporting China's, the free trade argument for China being able to be part of this system, and German, the German intelligence agencies, the German security leadership got increasingly nervous as they got more attentive to the problem. So I think it progresses the way most arguments in NATO progress, which is one or a few countries raise an issue that they're really nervous about, and NATO's the place where we talk about what we're nervous about. And everybody started to, to come to their own conclusions about it. And I do think the American position, as uncharitably as it was, and as undiplomatically as it was rolled out, um, is picking up substantive adherence, and that's a good thing for us all. It's good that we have these arguments. It's how we build a common position, and there's just no substitution for winning the argument. Thanks, Corey. Where are my mic runners? I want to just see mic runners. I want a mic here yes, for our Estonian colleague and a mic here I'm for right our there. Portuguese colleague, and I'm starting with you. I don't see my mic runners. Who are they? Run forward. So please go ahead. You start. Introduce yourself. Welcome. Hi, hello. Welcome. Hi, Damon. Uh, Katarzyna Pisarska, I'm the founder and director of uh, program director of the Warsaw Security Forum. Uh, thank you for a fascinating panel, very dynamic, uh, great job. But I do have uh, two questions. One is to uh, Gulnur. Um, I completely agree with you that allies are becoming, uh, you know, that the biggest challenge for us in NATO is that we have different security uh, challenges and we have different security perspectives. But with all due respect, the fact that President Erdogan uh, threatened to block the plan to defend the Baltic states and Poland is con completely unproductive. I think you have lost a lot of soft power only by that statement. I think it uh, raised a lot of red flags in Central Europe and uh, questioned a lot of uh, Turkey's, Turkey's commitment to our region. So I just wanted to ask you, what did that statement serve for? And uh, do you th think it was the right thing uh, to do? Gunnar, I'm gonna take a couple of questions. So thank you. Our, co our Polish colleagues putting on the table one of the controversies in the run-up to the summit about the defense plan in the east. So Gunnar, we'll come to you on that, but let me take our Estonian, Estonian colleague and our Portuguese colleague here. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, and thanks for an excellent panel. Uh, Sen Sako from International Center for Defense and Security 
in Tallinn. My first question was overtaken. I have exactly the same thing for our uh, Turkish friend. Uh, the second one is uh, to you, uh, Monsieur Gomart, um, kind of explaining President Macron. Um, and the, the question really stems from the fact that he has um, repeatedly said that he, um, that's a, he does not really trust the US anymore and he wants to build a new European security architecture together with Russia. Now, is he aware um, that this is exactly, precisely what Putin wants? To tear down the existing European security architecture and rebuild a new one where Russia is at the table and the US is not. Sure. Meaning that Russia would replace US as an outside arbiter of European security. Thank you, Sven. I'm gonna discipline our questions to keep them tight to get as many as possible. Let's turn to you, sir. Thank you, Damon. Um, Ricardo Leite, Member of Parliament from Portugal and uh, President of UNITE, the Global Network of Parliamentarians for Global Health. Um, the issue is around Russia, once again. Uh, the last time I heard the argument on compartmentalizing a relationship with a friend of mine who has a mistress trying to justify how he's going to keep his relationship with his family, well, I'm not sure that's going to work. And within NATO, if we must discuss, and I'd like to hear your opinion, what kind of bilateral and multilateral relationships we can have beyond the family so that the family can continue functional. But I heard everyone or many of you mention the, the need to reset the relationship with Russia. My question is, how does Crimea play in that situation? Are we going to give it up altogether? The sanctions clearly are not working. What's the next step? Thank, Thank you. you, Ricardo. And a brief question, Ambassador Poktororova, the final one in this opening, please. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. Um, first of all, congratulations to North Macedonia, coming from a neighbor that have always supported the membership of uh, um, Macedonia in NATO. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised if I bring your attention a little bit farther east from Central Europe, from the Balts. Um, we are discussing Russia and Turkey uh, at great extent. Uh, how would you uh, discuss, how would you comment Russia's uh, uh, influence plus combined with Turkish interests in the Balkans? Would you agree, and I'm trying to be not as provocative as President Macron, but almost, uh, uh, would you agree that the Balkans may turn to be the soft belly of of, uh, of transatlantic security. Terrific, thank you, Ambassador. Gunnar, why don't you start off with quick responses okay. here and then we'll come I'll down. start off with the issue about this defense plan um, for the Baltics and Poland. Now, this is actually an internal NATO matter. I don't think we should even be talking about this. I think the way it was leaked to the press has also led to a great deal of misunderstandings and it's been pulled into different directions. Uh, Turkey has always been there for the defense of its allies. We've been part of the planning process. We're going to be heading the command of the spearhead force of the uh, rapid readiness force. Uh, and these are internal NATO matters. Now, regard but now it's out in the press, of course. Uh, these kinds of negotiations do happen within the alliance behind closed doors about certain documents at the approval stage, right? Now, the same document of the similar sort uh, for Turkey's security uh, actually framed the YPG as a terrorist organization. Now, some allies, I think actually one particular ally had an objection to that, and therefore they have blocked Turkey's uh, defense plan. And in turn, at that moment, this other defense plan was about to be approved. And right now, Turkey's position is that this cannot be security for some allies, but it has to be security for all allies. What this debate has done, which was unfortunately supposed to be an internal debate, and it's very unfortunate it's, come, it's been leaked out in this way, um, is that it's actually forced us to face the fact that, you know, of course we have different security concerns, like we've talked about China and so forth, medium, long term, but then there are also immediate national security concerns. And there you cannot have a compromise and address the uh, immediate national security concerns of some allies and not address the immediate national concerns of another ally. So at, in terms of national security concerns, 
We really have to be on the same page. Otherwise, we will not be able to agree on anything else. Don't That's the time on the clock. I'm gonna, uh, but I want to say a few things on Russia, but maybe let the others pitch in and then come me, back to Russia. Because I was Bob. asked about that. Okay. Yeah. Let me pick up to Bob yeah. because you had, there was some skepticism about French views. Quick, quick response to the skeptics out there. Uh, I would respond to your question uh, coming yes. from this gentleman yes. and, and, the, and this one. So the question is, is President Macron aware that, you know, a, a discussion directly between Europeans and Russians are the one um, expected by, uh, by Putin? Yes, he is. He's aware. Uh, now, what does it mean? That means also, if you read all the statements, you know, that it is always said that we should have uh, a dialogue um, franc and direct with Russia with our allies. And, you know, I have already mentioned the term naivete. There is absolutely no naivete about, you know, the nature of Putin's uh, regime. But it's me to your question. The assessment, the assessment which has been made also by President Macron, it is to take into consideration 2013. And the fact that all weaknesses, all Western weaknesses, give a way for Russia, especially in Syria. Where is the coherence, you know, and the consistent approach? Unfortunately for all of us, it is in Russia. If you remind, you know, 2003, there were three countries against, you know, the intervention in Iraq, Russia, Germany, and France, okay? It was a much more difficult, difficult time than our times, I, I think, you know, for sure. So the problem is, is also to accept that. It's to accept our own failures and the fact that we let you know, uh, the field to the Russians. No intervention in 2013. Have a look about the consequences, you know, in Syria. So I stop there. So my, I'm going to, just for the sake of the audience, I'm going to uh, jump to the next two questions, this gentleman here and the young woman over there. Please introduce yourself. Quick questions in our last three minutes. Flip it on at the bottom. Hello. Justine, uh, yes, you just talk right into it. Yep. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, Justin Bronk from Rusi. I'm an air defense specialist. Uh, my question was to Gulna. Uh, you, you, just, you justified the S-400 purchase, which is one of the key splits within NATO, on the grounds of a key military requirement. How does that sit with the fact that the S-400 system, particularly if not joined up to Turkey's air picture, common air picture, which is NATO standard, so cannot be integrated, A, can't be used against enemy aircraft because you won't see IFF, identification friend or foe, or even air traffic control information, but also the fact that the S-400 system is not actually compatible with defending against the short-range rockets, artillery fire and mortars from Syrian territory that you're actually concerned about. Thank you, sir. All right, to the young woman over here in 15 seconds, a short question, please. Have confidence, speak right into it. Thank you. Um, would you say that many of the differing opinions within NATO come from um, a different approach to an issue or like a different end goal um, as to what you're trying to achieve? All right, terrific. So to do this wrap up, that's a great question. If you look at these issues in tactical micro, the day to day, my gosh, look, look at all these differences and divisions. Tamar reminded us this ain't new. This is a family. This is where family problems get fleshed out. So how significant are these divisions and if you take perspective on this alliance. Gulner, first answer, Thomas, Corey, Thomas. I'll start off with, uh, with Russia, because that was something I was going to say. Now, I mean, having a compartmentalized relationship does not mean a lack of principles. I think that's what you were alluding to. It actually helps in the sense that if uh, you have a geostrategic reality like we do, you know, you could just have to look at the map where we are, um, then you have to have sort of strands of cooperation of, with neighboring states. But the compartmentalized part has allowed us also to be very firm with Russia when it comes to Ukraine. And you know, we have very good relations with Ukraine. We're actually uh, selling them drones right now. So, you know, we, we've also got a defense agreement with them. And uh, so, and Russia doesn't mind that because we're, you know, doing things in other areas with them. So, but I think overall, we're quite happy to sort of continue like this with our own policy, but because we do value NATO, I think it's important for NATO, as you said, a family, to have a wider strategic picture 
about how we deal with Russia. Thank you. And we totally support that. And as for the S-400, how we're going to use it, in what context, as a standalone system, I can't talk about that. You can appreciate that. Uh, but it will be a standalone system, and all the technical questions are being addressed by the joint U.S. Uh, Turkish committee We've hit the right clock, now. so I'm going to ask my remaining colleagues to give us your headline conclusion, uh, Tomas. Sure. L let me do that really quickly in the light of time and only address the last question. Are there fundamental disagreements among allies or are we looking at tactical differences? My sense, putting on my Central European hat, is that there is no fundamental disagreement between Central European allies and the rest on even the controversial issues, sensitive issues of how do you treat Russia, what exactly is Europe's role in defense. I had a good fortune recently of editing a report for NATO on NATO's next 70 years. The a chapter on deterrence was written by an excellent Polish think tank. The author is here in place. It was very open-minded, very, took a very broad view of deterrence. There is no reflexive insistence on a status quo. What there is, my last 10 seconds, is a concern about the way the conversation was opened. We're open, I think, to exploring whether a better relationship with Russia is available. We understand the need for Europe to stand more on its own feet. It comes not just from President Macron, but also from President Trump. But how you proceed makes an awful lot of difference. We have a security order in Europe that works. It's not perfect. Can it be improved? Absolutely. Is it good that we have a very little conversation with Russia? No. So we're open to looking at how you fix it. But you don't start out with a presumption, as President Macron seems to have, that the U.S. will inevitably bow out of the European security picture. You don't start out with a presumption that a much better arrangement with Russia can be had, that it's realistic, because evidence suggests uh, otherwise. Thank you. And I'm a son of a doctor, my last sentence. The first rule in medicine is do no harm. And I think that would be a very good way of, of that's a very good philosophy and a mindset uh, to keep in mind as we start thinking about a better security good architecture advice. for good, Europe. Good advice, Toma. Corey. I think we often disagree on the ends because we have more than one end we are trying to attain. We often disagree on the means because there are many different ways to successfully navigate problems. And we often disagree on the language in which we talk about them. But what makes NATO successful and what makes it valuable to all of our countries is the fact that we let ourselves be persuaded by each other and we identify where our interests overlap and where we can find common approaches. And that's why NATO is so successful. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Corey. Final word, Thomas. Yeah, I think that NATO is a family with new members. Welcome to North Macedonia. And in each family, there are turbulent people. So, you know, France is an Atlantic and also a Latin country. And I think that President Macron prepare a very lively dinner for, to, for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. Our presidents, our prime ministers, the leaders have given us a lively conversation. Please join me in thanking our opening panel discussants. Could have had a better job. And thank you for being such active participants. The show will continue, please. <laughs> thank you, Tom.